Welcome, students, to the uh, hybrid material for Alain Robrier, The Secret Room. This is our shortest reading of the semester, uh, so you'll see at the end of our talk today I'm going to ask you to uh, possibly read this more than once. It's also one of the strangest things that we're going to read all semester, so I, I hope that you'll um, find some kind of enjoyment in it. And this is something we can return to later, is the question of how are we supposed to enjoy these strange works. So we're going to be uh, seeing some of Robrier's take on this question, what is art for? Uh, maybe you won't be surprised to see that art as, as strange as this is focused sometimes on this question of what's the purpose of art. Um, obviously, Robrier is an experimental writer, uh, not just a writer of fiction, but also a theorist. So I'll be quoting from some of his theoretical works about uh, writing that he put out. And he, he also ended up working a lot in uh, film. So I don't know if you've ever seen a film called Last Year at Marion Bad, but it's, it's one of the greatest films ever made. And uh, it's full of the same kind of approach uh, to art that Robrier takes in this story that we have today called The Secret Room. Uh, what else do we need to know at this point? He's, he's French. Um, you might have guessed from his name. He is active in the middle part of the 20th century. He started off as an agronomist. Uh, and then when he was about 30 years old, decided to just totally switch tracks and go in and start writing literature. So that was around uh, 1952, and he kind of like stood the world on its ear. He was part of a group uh, that includes Samuel Beckett and Natalie Sarot and a couple of other uh, really important writers who initially were, you know, rejected, but, but eventually they were recognized as um, pretty great authors. So let's go over and look at these literary concepts. So we have some kind of meta concepts today, maybe. Um, so that big question is, are literary values transcendent? Or are they historical? Do they change over time? Or do they sort of last forever? From the perspective of somebody like Aristotle, you might see that Aristotle is the kind of figure who wants to say, uh, we enjoy certain things fundamentally because of who we are as humans, and we'll always enjoy them. That's kind of uh, his take on mimesis. Uh, Robrier is really on the other end of the scale. He's going to say that literary values are historical and that every generation needs to reinvent the novel. And so he was really fed up, uh, and I'll talk more about this in the historical context, but he was really fed up with literature that was just sort of repeating 19th century realism, that was sort of maintaining those same values from before. So uh, he and a few other people became connected with this movement called the Nouvelle Roman. Uh, or new novel. The idea here was to reject everything that went into realistic writing from the past. So uh, he's getting rid of character, for instance. Uh, he wants to be done with plot, right? So, so about character, he says character is a thing of the past. It's a set of uh, rules that we allowed ourselves to be pleased by for some time, but with which we can now dispense. Uh, as personal character and the effectiveness of the individual gives way to a sort of expanded consciousness. So you can see that um, character is not something that he's invested in in the same way that an author like Charles Dickens might have been. Uh, similarly about story, he says that plots were there for entertainment and that works, um, that, that entertainment works because it reflects the pre-established schemas for stories that readers already have. The substance of the story has to seem inexhaustible, as if the author knew everything that happened in that world and could relate it all if needed. And Rob Gray really wants to get past that sense of this kind of continuous story world that's out there somewhere. He wants to say that the writer's strength comes from invention. So rather than saying that writing has a natural relationship with the world, he wants to say writing is an intervention in the world. He doesn't want to get rid of plot. So something definitely happens in the secret room, for instance, as you'll see. Uh, but he does want to see plot sort of deranged and stripped of its innocence and certainty. So he wants to sort of question some of these things. And that's really the essence of the new novel, is getting in there and saying, hold it, why do we feel like this is realistic? Let's see what happens when we get rid of this. Later in his career, uh, Rob Gray put out some of what he called Cine Roman. Uh, like, for instance, one of them was a series of 75 paintings by René Magritte uh, interspersed with comments, with uh, words by Robrier. So he's really interested in getting sort of to these uh, new places with art. 
And um, the reason I mention the Sin and Roman here is that we might see some aspect of that in today's reading, the sense that we're having um, several images described to us, not necessarily in order. We might have that same sense of uh, this sort of series of images presented to us. And that's connected with our last word uh, here, which is ekphrasis. So an ekphrasis is an artistic response to another piece of art. Uh, and this should look better. Uh, the resolution on this picture is kind of low. Anyway, this is a painting by a guy called Gustave Moreau, who was uh, somebody who Rogre really liked, and uh, whose paintings have this kind of like sumptuous, uh, decadent quality to them. In this case, here's Salome uh, dancing for us. And so if, if you take the time, if you just Google Gustave Moreau, you'll find a whole bunch of paintings that uh, sort of look like the kind of imagery that's described to us in the secret room. So another way that we might think about the secret room is as an example of ekphrasis, a, uh, a written response to some visual art. So let's look at uh, some historical contexts. What we have to know about is uh, French socialism in the mid 20th century and also socialist realism. So the question here really for uh, for Robrier is what's the value of art for a socialist? At this time, socialism was uh, quite popular in France. It was a big movement, uh, which would come to a head in 1968. A little bit later, if you learn uh, about modern European history, you'll hear all about 1968 in France. But uh, at this time, we've got Robrier, and he's sort of chafing at what the socialists want art to do, because and this is what socialist realism is. It's a sense that uh, art needs to be realistic. It needs to represent the world the way it is. And it also needs to further the goals of the revolution. So really, socialist realism for, for Rogrier is really limited uh, in, its, in its perspective. So let's, I'm going to read you a little bit about what he has to say about this. Uh, he writes, Indeed, from the viewpoint of the revolution, everything must directly contribute to the final goal, the liberation of the proletariat. Everything, including literature, painting, etc., but for the artist, on the contrary, and despite his firmest political conventions, convictions, even despite his goodwill as a militant revolutionary, art cannot be reduced to the status of a means in the service of a cause which transcends it. Even if this cause were the most deserving, the most exalting, the artist puts nothing above his work, and he soon comes to realize that he can only create for nothing. The least external directive paralyzes him. The least concern for didacticism or even for signification is an insupportable constraint. Whatever his attachment to his parties or to generous ideas, the moment of creation can only bring him back to the problems of his art and to them alone. So you can see that uh, Rogrier takes this really hard line and says, no, uh, you can't create art to serve the, the ends of a socialist revolution. That, that's not uh, what we're about at all. And I want, I'm pointing this out because um, it is a big part of our historical context and it's going to help us understand the story, but also because there's kind of a bizarre similarity between this mid-century French socialist moment in which everything has to uh, sort of show how it's paying for itself, you know, how it's contributing to the revolution, and our current moment at which um, university education is being turned largely into job training. So we were at this moment of, you know, the decline of the humanities and, and all of this, uh, because, you know, studying English doesn't lead directly to a good job. So I think it's really interesting that late capitalism and mid-century uh, French socialism have this really strong thing in common. So with Robrier, we're seeing this really strong art for art's sake argument. Um, but, okay, so here's the interesting sort of limit on the other side. You may have heard of some people who, who approach art... Uh, as, as part of a revolution, as something that can really serve a purpose. And here's what he has to say about that. He says, Meanwhile, that generous but utopian way of talking about a novel, a painting, or a statue, as if they might count for as much in everyday action as a strike, a mutiny, or the cry of a victim denouncing his executioners, is a disservice, ultimately, to both art and revolution. To many such confusions have been, uh, too many such confusions have been perpetrated in recent years in the name of socialist realism. The total artistic indigence of the works which insist on its tenets is certainly not the effect of chance. The very notion of a work created for the expression of a social, political, economic, or moral content constitutes a lie. So Robrier is saying, 
we absolutely cannot have art uh, whose purpose is to uh, serve a preconceived idea that's out there already. And that's how he sees all of realistic fiction, is that it's, uh, it's really just given us um, preconceived notions that we've already sort of adapted as, as real, and, and we're just sort of replaying them over and over again. And, and uh, so I don't want to beat this point to death, but I do want to say that this is a big part of what I'm trying to teach you in this class, to see that you have to encounter art in its strangeness and what it does that you don't already know in order to get anything at all out of it. So, uh, art has to be sort of everything. It has to be its own thing that you allow to have its own logic. Now, we're going to have to see if we actually believe that. We're going to have to go on the other side and think about, um, you know, if, if Rogrier's story is dependent on Gustav Moreau's painting, is there sort of a relationship of the work of art to something outside of itself? That might be sort of an interesting problem for us. And, and I'll raise one more concern uh, here momentarily. So close reading evidence. Um, I've put here reading and rereading. I hope that because this reading is particularly short that you will read it more than once because the final words of the, of the text point you sort of back to the beginning. You almost have to go back and read it again once you see the final word. And I, I, I won't reveal it to you now, but when you see it, you'll realize that you need to go back. Um, the other reason that you have to sort of go back and reread is is to try to sort of figure out what order things were put in. There are plenty of clues about the order, but it's not straightforward at all. So you'll see um, Robe Grier, you know, messing with those traditional tenets of realism. And that's the sort of thing that I want you to be on the lookout for. How is this story uh, interrupting our sense of character, plot, ordering, all of that stuff? How is all that sort of going haywire? The other big question, and the reason that I don't have a passage we're going to look at today, is I want to ask, can this text be interpreted? A lot of times we think oh, we need to read this story and read it closely and pay attention to the signals somehow to get to like whatever the deeper meaning is. I really don't like that metaphor, but it's, it's how we end up talking a lot of times. Uh, but this, this st text is almost all surface, so you'll see that it's extremely objective. And what Robrier is interested in is the brute fact of existence. So, we'll return to this question, can this text even be interpreted as such? Okay, so some things to keep in mind as you're reading. Uh, surface and depth, right? Is, is there a possibility that uh, this story has no depth to it, that it's just pure surface? And that might also connect with this question of style and content. We kind of talked about that with uh, Kafka this week. And uh, you'll have to see what you think, because Rob Grier wants to say that style is content. Ultimately, the work of art is about how it's done, not what it does. And that leads us to our final question, art for art's sake. What are the limits there? Why do you think Rob Grier chooses to depict this scene of violence the way he does? Is it okay for an artist to uh, aestheticize violence in this way? And, and as you're thinking about that, I want you to also consider... Have you run into any other kinds of entertainment that uh, turn violence into something beautiful through style? So we're going to think about what are the limits of stylization? What, at what point does the content actually overwhelm uh, the, the style? Okay, so that was kind of a quick run through here. Um, but I hope you'll get a chance to read this story a couple of times, and we'll, we'll cap it off at the end of this week. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you tomorrow.